Absolutely. There's a wonderful book by uh, Amir Fide, uh, who's a, a sort of a business economist who's up the top. Uh, he did a book called The Call to Judgment. And Amir's the most Austrian Austrian I know. And his basic point is the following. We've built a banking system where there's no shame. And he means something very specific by that. The interactions aren't face to face. So your credit score is designed by someone in Philly and then done on an algorithm bed somewhere on a computer in Texas, which spits out a number which is then reported back to someone else, and because of that you do or you do not get a mortgage. So there are no loan officers anymore. It's like beat cops, it's like the argument for neighborhood policing, right? There's nobody on the beat who actually understands the credit condition. So until you restore those very basic functional relationships, until you bring shame back into it, until you bring embarrassment back into the relationship in a sense, then you can't fix it. So another way of thinking about this is the way that banks work internally. So there's a wonderful way, period of a set of asymmetries in this. If you lose money, if you work in a bank and everyone else loses money, you keep your job. If you make money when everyone else loses money, you get promoted. Right. If you make money when everybody else makes money, you keep your job. And the worst possible one, of course, is if everyone else makes money and you lose money, you're done. This creates pro-cyclicality in terms of risk taking. So everybody has to take on more risk. But if everybody takes on more risk, all you've done is basically shove the median risk of any given portfolio up. So everybody then says, well, I need hedges. So they all use the same hedges, <laughs> which means that you're actually not hedging anything. So in what's called the super portfolio of risk cannot be diversified. So you end up exacerbating this problem over time. Now, this is all happening several orders up, whereby the guy who makes the bonus and drives the Lamborghini and lives in the London Docklands, who's buying all these things, never has to face his consequences. There's no shame. There's nothing in that. So one of the, the ethical argument for downsizing banking is precisely to bring shame back in that sense. And I wholeheartedly agree. Jamie Dimon will shoot you before that ever happens because it destroys his business model. That's very interesting because the point is that we still have an interventionist situation. Mm -hmm. And the kind of we move towards uh, what Dominic Strauss talking about said, voluntary cooperation. You know, if you go back to the 1920s, Hoover was a much maligned president who actually cared greatly about unemployment. But being a business cycle theorist, he, his, his solution was always more voluntary cooperation. And more voluntary cooperation is a really good idea so long as things are going well. So you can think about basal banking regulation. The banks sit down, write it themselves, their own risk models become the adjudicators, how much risk is taken on. Nobody gives a shit. Why? Because everything's going like this. It's only when it goes down, though, that you have a problem. So we're only risk sensitive to the downside. And there's a deep political problem in this. There is no downside to the upside of an asset bubble for a democratic politician. There's a great essay in Foreign Affairs, John Quiggin and Henry Farrell from a couple of years ago, called Real Keynesianism. And he points out something that I've always had into it but never actually wrote it down. There are no Keynesian politicians because no one votes for tax increases at the top of a boom. It's just impossible. It's never going to happen. So you need to have some kind of extra parliamentary counter cyclical complement to the independent central bank on the other side. And if you do that, you might be able to generate a world in which those problems are obviated. But relying on Congress to vote for tax increases on property at the height of a housing bubble, I've got a bridge in Brooklyn to sell you. That's never going to happen. <laughs>